You are listening to the Light Overtime Podcast with David Sargent and Corey Bartos. Hi guys. How are you today, bud? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm all right. What are you drinking today? I just brewed up some of this Ethiopia, uh, what is it? The Banco Gotidi Farm from Gadeb. Very good stuff. Milk chocolate, um, nectarine, and bubblegum was what was on the uh, notes for this um, this this green coffee I bought. The bubblegum is a little bit subdued, if you might imagine, but the, the citrus nectarine type of thing is definitely there. It's nice. I am not sure how I feel about bubblegum as a tasting note. <laughs> Dude, it's wild. It's like it's just kind of like this candied, sugary type of thing going on. It's good. Uh, I still don't have coffee at the place that I'm staying, so I have lewd energy. Oh. Today. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> All right, so <sighs> I wanted to kick this show off today with uh, what you've been shooting. So uh, if you guys are listening or watching this on YouTube, uh, go to David's Instagram and look at his recent post with his A7C because I thought. It was a photo from Pete's Pirate Life. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's pretty. It's pretty stylized. It was, yeah, it was good. Sure. I liked it. I was like, "Oh shit, that's David." Um, <laughs> you know the the really warm but dark <clears throat> scene with some <clears throat> glass. It looked nice and fancy. I was like, "Yeah, it's pretty good." Yeah, I like starting off this way because this is actually an excellent. Um, request to our viewers too if you're on youtube or whatever throw in um, a comment down below if you're watching on the video what you're working on this week too i'd love to hear it for me um basically i just busted out the a7c for the first time really taking some actual photos um i actually set it up on a tripod um with the 85 mil lens and uh just took a bunch of photos of me getting some brews ready um i used the rgb uh cube i've got to kind of set the style for a colorway because I got I painted my kitchen this nice like really subdued blue hue um, and then I've got like a wood countertop and then I just threw in a bunch of like <clears throat> scarlet orange light and made some nice complementary color scenes going on so basically between altering the light and really stylizing in Lightroom um, I made some nice stuff it was uh, kind of a fun little practice um, for some more stuff I'll be doing when I start practicing that for while I'm roasting and uh, putting that to good use. Right on. Yeah, I like it. I like to see it. Um, uh, outside of outside of work this week, uh, I'm trying to figure out this 14 to 24 mil. Uh, yeah. 14 is wide, man. I have, so I have a Rokinon, um, like T 3.1 Cine lens and I've used it. I mostly used it with my GH five because it was about a 21 mil equivalent on, uh, my GH five with the speed booster and 21. If you're not familiar is like every frame that Steven Spielberg has ever done is 21 mil. <laughs> so like that field of view it's really easy to make it look like movies like because a lot of our favorite movies have been shot on that 21 mil um so i used it often back then but uh then i got you know once i got into sony i'm using autofocus a lot more because i'm solo solo manning a camera and things like that but uh autofocus photography at 14 mil is bananas <laughs> uh it makes me feel like i don't know how to compose a scene because it's so wide so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, come to think of it, I've never been there myself. The last time I had a 14 mil was with the manual focus for Sam Yang, I believe, or Sam Yang, Rokinon, whatever it was. Um, and that's a lot of fun. And it, with it being so wide, there's not a whole lot of throw, right? You go front to back pretty quickly. Um, but having autofocus, especially I can, I use my 20 mil for uh, wedding receptions often being right in the dance floor and having autofocus on the 20 mil is great. It's qu it's quick and you don't want to miss because you're way down at one eight or one four or whatever it is. So having it at 14 for su a similar applications, I think would be really, really useful. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's just really nice because the, um, the, the throw between 14 and 24 is really interesting when you have a subject close up and you do like a vertigo zoom. Uh, it, it's baffling how wild the background looks when you pull focus or when you pull zoom and let the autofocus like lock on to a subject. So that's really, really wild. Um, I think I'm probably going to use that pretty effectively for some upcoming, um, like product video showcasing stuff I'm going to do. Uh, 
but it's it's just wild. It's like a new it's like kind of a new world because there aren't that many lenses that are in this focal length at two eight on a full frame. So it's uh it's been pretty wild. <laughs> Yeah, do you want to tell the folks what you traded for it? Yeah, so I uh, I'm shooting on the 28 to 70 f2.8 from Sigma right now, and because I've been using this so much at work, I don't really need the 24 to 105, which was like the godsend for video in general because of the OSS, but also it's it's not as clinically sharp as some of the sigmas and things like that i liked it a lot for video um and obviously 24 to 105 is basically every range you would ever need as a videographer um it makes a lot of sense but because a lot more of what i'm doing now is going to be more stylized or more controlled or like on a flat range for work and things like that i just don't need it so i got rid of my 24 to 105 and i have an old fe 85 that i never use and i always complain about and it was like dented and it was just like kind of meh and i i kind of used that to throw in some value and pick up this like almost minty uh 14 to 24 uh and i don't i I don't regret it i don't know how much i'm going to be able to use this lens but uh (laughs) i definitely don't regret the trade so um it's yeah yeah. yeah, it's interesting kind of having a spark of of new creativity and a, a, a different tool like when i got the 200 to 600 it's like that's a very different range of true focal length, not just like zooming in and stuff um, or cropping and whatnot. So to actually get different optics is um, pretty wild. That's fun. And I know you said that you can vlog with 24 millimeters, but having it a lens that goes all the way back to 14, how comfortable is that for you? Is there a focal length in that lens that you think you'd have it really comfortable at? Like a 20 or 16? I... <laughs> It's so unnecessary. Like I can vlog comfortably at 28. So, yeah. okay. so for my crazy long arm, like when I stretch my arm out uh, on my Instagram story right now, I have uh, like a, a little teaser of it. But like I'm, like, s- this is still tighter. That is still tighter <laughs> than uh, like what that 14. It's insane. I I have a I have yeah, a six yeah. foot ten and a half inch wingspan. So like my arm length is so so cre- incredibly long. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to be outstretched the entire time that you'd per, you know vlog if that was ever something you'd be doing. I mean, is is 14, 16, 18 something that's much more comfortable for you no. now that you have? I, it? I don't. Not I really? still would rather be on a twenty four. I think <laughs> it's oh, it's pretty okay, wild. Okay. Like I I'm pretty pretty comfortable at twenty four. The twenty was sweet, oh, cool. but um, I actually found that with the twenty, I bring it so close, and that's actually more uncomfortable for me. Weirdly enough. Um, I feel like I got to bring it like way tighter all the time. So 24 is plenty wide for, for my hands. Um, hell, even on my, uh, my GH five, I was using a Canon 24 to one Oh five with the speed booster. And, uh, I, I can't really calculate what that was, but it was still plenty wide for, uh, my vlogging situation. So, yeah. Uh, just, just playing with that this weekend, but, um, I, I mostly have been kind of playing with the 90 mil macro at work and I'm trying to, uh, get some like stylized reels going for some products. And, uh, I, I busted out my small rig, like cage and everything and have like my, uh, um, I had a 35 mil Sigma that had a, um, a ring for gears and it fits the 90 mil macro. So I actually put that on the 90 mil macro and I cannot tell you for macro stuff, how nice it is to have like a nice follow focus situation. Um, because I have the, my follow focus is from Tilta and it has little locks so I can get a start and a stop and I can just very easily, you know, um, go over and over and do the same same focus pull that I need and whatnot. Uh, the 90 mil has a, a autofocus to manual focus clutch on it, which I wish so many more lenses did because it's so nice. But um, yeah, that's been that's been pretty fun. It's been a busy week. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I have a couple of topics here because I think you and I have talked about it a little bit, but for some reason with. Uh, a couple of things that happened this week in tech. Um, I got back into reading some stuff about AI and I wanted to have kind of a formal piece, uh, hearing your, um, 
thoughts and feelings about the the state of AI. I, I have some uh, articles in the show notes that I'll kind of reference. Um, one being why film photography is the antithesis of AI art and how AI art fooled the judges and won a, a photo contest, which isn't the first time that's happened. That's happened a bunch. But um, I just, I think it's interesting. How how do you feel sure. about the, the prospects of AI art and its effect on oh. photography? It's not a simple topic, um, and that's obvious because there's, I mean, if, you're, if, if you exist on Facebook for five minutes in a week, you can see this topic pop up over and over again, and there are two very, I mean, probably three or four very different sides to um, what's going on with AI specifically in the art space, and there's a lot of people who just um, are so very narrowly focused on one perspective of how AI is to be used or shouldn't be used. And I've got some thoughts when it comes to, I mean, it's so, it's so, oh man, it's such a big topic. It's so huge because you have the perspective of competitions. You have the perspective of, of photographers who are beginning to utilize AI art. You have whether things are being disclosed or not, how they're being disclosed. Um, there's so much to talk about. I mean, All right, so let me, let me simplify, let's break it yeah. down to like, let me yeah. simplify it to how do you feel AI art will affect your photography? My photography? Not, not really at all. Um, when we talk about, at least for me, where my inspiration comes, what motivates me to do photography, a AI really doesn't play a role. Um, I, what I like doing with AI, because I have access to Dolly 2, um, and I like seeing what other people are doing with it, I am not one of those people who are like, destroy everything AI when it comes to art. I can talk about that a little bit more later, but when it comes to me, um, I don't use AI or go to anything AI generated for me to be motivated or inspired to, to make art. And maybe that'll change in the future. But for now, I watch a lot of other photographers who are also not touching AI in any way. And photography has been around for hundreds of years, people being motivated by natural things in the real world um and that's you know that's it's that's it that's its own thing and i i love it as a process but man it's such a broad topic i mean we could go on to like competitions how how things should be disclosed like we've had this in competitions for a while now where lightroom and, photo and, and photoshop and any any kind of software and post-processing that's used on digital photography a lot of what's done has to be disclosed and there are a lot of requirements with competitions that say you can only make um corrections to color and exposure you cannot do spot healing you cannot do this 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 and that and if you do you are you are uh, disqualified and you are banned from ever entering competitions again and sometimes people make it through where they do these things and go oh they'll never know and sometimes those people get caught and they get barred from ever entering competitions again. I think what what needs to happen, and I've said this to a few people, is um, the software that can detect what's AI generated needs to be opened up and, and used in a defensive way such that some of these facilities are protected from people who are trying to game the system. Um, and I would like to see something like a copyright type of overarching system that kind of globally protects artists and also is able to tag and disclose what is AI generated art. I don't have any idea how these systems can be developed, but I would like to see a way for AI art to be identified, not from um, not relying on the person who's made it or posted it to say so, but a system that is reliable for anyone to be able to go in and see metadata on something that is AI generated and say that it is so. That's fair. And a lot more than I think, I think my brain cares about. Uh, I, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely see what you're saying. Um, There's so much more I can even go I on just, about because I've thought about this topic I, so I much think, in the last year. I think that whole, that whole part of it is just so freaking boring because I don't think, <sighs> My interest in the topic of AI is why people feel like it imposes a threat on their like way of life or their ability to create, uh, et cetera. And for me, 
I think if you're scared that AI is going to put you out of like making digital art or whatever, then you need to like either market better or understand that this is this is how things have always happened music yeah. now is being produced at a higher level in people's bedrooms and things like that ai is never a threat to you unless you're like milking something and you're taking advantage of people and that's why you're worried about it i don't think that like <laughs> I just truly don't think that if somebody wants handmade art, they're going to go for handmade art. If I want like a cool ass thing to hang on my wall, I don't care. And I know that because people buy pirated ripped off designs off Redbubble right now all the time and other sites like Etsy and stuff. People either don't give a shit at all or they do. And if you're producing something that somebody wants, they'll buy it from you. you you're never going to go to scale uh, nowadays, I think like it, it's, it's as, it's as rare as blowing up on TikTok or blowing up on YouTube that your handmade medium of art is going to be like the next greatest thing that's ever happened. That time has yeah. passed us for music. That time has passed us for like that whole entire pie in the sky idea for me is completely gone and I don't see that as like a negative thing. I'm not cynical about that and I don't think that it's problematic. I think people need to like kind of reframe what they're trying to get from life and why they do art and why they tell stories. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I don't personally feel threatened. However, it, this is a force that's not going to be stopped. Right. We have to accept that this these platforms and facilities and systems are going to be developed on further. No one's going to pull back on this and go, oh, this is maybe not, we're not ready for this. No, we're, we're seeing a, tons of these systems popping up now, new ones all the time. We're not going to stop this as an entire industry. It is rolling now. What I would like is for voices that really really want to be heard they should be heard and when i was talking about like copyright systems that involve ai i would like to see kind of like when you when you post on flickr or <laughs> when you used to post on flickr um you were able to set what kind of copyright definitions you wanted and that could potentially include be used or like not be used for ai to generate um for for ai to generate use of your content um so i'm you know maybe that can happen in the future one day if someone feels so strongly that they just do not want their content to be used for ai um i would like to see some kind of at least discussion on that topic yeah well i mean that's that's the only truly problematic thing i see is like if your ai was using a database that like stole people's things I think that's disingenuous and horrible, but like as far as AI in general, like replacing copywriters or repl like that's the automation that will eventually make life more sustainable. Like I, the argument for like, well, it's going to take jobs and things like that is never meaningful to me in any way, because if there's a tool that's going to do something, that's why we had uh, the freaking industrial revolution and everything else. Like we just, it's so difficult on this end to see how things like that will change us in the future. So to, to spend a bunch of energy feeling like you're obsolete, human beings don't really exhibit obsolescence yet you're not going to be obsolete because you can reroute and you still have things that computers can't have and you still can do things that computers can't do just because it's doing a task that you spend 40 hours or more a week on doing does not mean that you're replaced and that it, the world is going to end for you that is just not the case and i i truly believe that that's not something people should be worried about yeah, I mean, it's understandable that there are some loud voices right now talking about what's being used with these databases. I mean, <laughs> I get a chuckle out of it sometimes, but I do feel for some of these artists that work really hard and they see some identifiers like, have you seen the, some, some of these are pulling in like Shutterstock logos and things yeah. and like, not just like general signatures. Like that was the first little thing yeah. to come out going, Oh, Hey, there are signatures. They're not exact signatures of any one person. They're just kind of like amalgamations of many signatures. It thinks that, you know, should be put on in certain dead space areas or whatever. But we are seeing 
like there are a lot of images out there that have the same exact shutterstock or whatever type of logo plucked onto an image in the same part of an image so some of these are generating what it thinks uh should be there and just so happens that these kinds of watermarks are all over in the same place yeah. it's an interesting thing and it's it's got valid uh the concern for this is valid yeah. Um, I would like to hear if anybody has strong feelings about some of this because what I struggle with as someone who makes for a living, I literally make for a living, it's my primary duty um, and it's what I do for fun as well, like I have a hard time with just art for art. Like I do I only have so many walls. I only have so much income. It's not like uh, I buy a piece of art like once a week or a couple times a, a month or like I'm constantly rotating pictures on my wall or whatever. And I have a lot of people in my life that do physical mediums of art, drawing, oil, pastels, painting, sculpture that I that I appreciate a lot. But all of the people in my life that do this kind of for a living, for the most part, that I can kind of think of off the top of my head, they kind of always understood the luxury behind people buying their art. It's not, it's not something that has utility uh, when we're talking about how we have, like, you know, a, a pretty rough economical situation going on. That's all I'll really get with that. Like people are struggling to just pay people for art like mm -hmm. a lot of my friends also who are in those those spaces they take some of their ability to create art and they market it and they they utilize it to do freelance art for businesses and stuff like that mm -hmm. and that and i get that but like if you're upset that like dolly or mid-journey style art is like making people not buy your prints on your etsy or something i really struggle with that being an actual inherent issue because just like making videos which is basically a commodity now like people are either going to want to watch your stuff or they're not and they're going to want your images or not so like it's just too hard to yeah. say this is a problem for me and it's not fair because it's it's there's it's there's not fairness involved period <laughs> right i i can speak a little to that from personal experience um i had this little series going on my instagram stories when i first got access to dolly where i would post an image um a brand new image that i've never posted before and then i would go into dolly and try to very accurately describe for it what my image looks like and almost every time it spit out an image that looked so much like what I told it that has never been on the internet before. It wasn't trained on what was posted. Like it could not have known what it looked like. I, the very first one I think I did was I told it exactly the image of two sandhill cranes flying across a sky, an orange sky. It, it's, not a, it's not a complex image by any means, but what it spit out for me was almost to a T what my image looked like. It's not mine though. If someone wanted to buy that as a print, they're not gonna buy the AI generated version, right? They might wanna rip it off for free and just put it on their wall. Doesn't bother me, it's not mine. It, it, it may have been trained to look for images like mine, but it's not mine. So that's, it doesn't, it's not something that really bothers me too much. I agree, like I, I having talked to some people that buy art, for like doctor's offices and I and I actually have reached out to a lot of these people because I've you know back when I was getting into photography seriously I was like hey like <coughs> are you looking for refresh start in your thing I'd love to sell you a print like at a good deal so you can have some local art in your doctor's office that kind of stuff mm -hmm. they don't care like yeah. those those people don't care they either have like one of their people in their life or an intern or somebody like often just like hey we want to kind of change the vibes in the room if you could like swap some of these photos out like a lot of places they just truly don't care some places do and those places will buy your art and i'd be willing to bet that if somebody cares they would buy word of mouth or like looking up like a you know a northern michigan like landscape photographer want to find spend that effort to support one of those artists but i i don't think the ai thing really maybe a small percentage but i don't think it's affecting the people that want to buy art that much 
for you small artists out there photographers painters whatever it is what i've seen um like from certain hospitals and places that just put up art because they don't want to look so clinical is they'll put out a call to artists with an application form and they'll tell people this is our budget for what we want to spend and we will pay such and such amount for the artists that we choose we'll, we're going to choose 10 artists so please apply and if you make it in we'll give you so much money to have your print put up in our you know that's the thing you can look out for yeah i mean there's 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 a lot of ways that you're still going to sell your art and if people want it they're going to buy yeah. it and it'll still be the same people looking for that art um but it's a hard time I, like I, I feel for any of you photographers out there who are just starting going i would love to get a printer and just start selling my art yeah. it is rough it's always been rough i don't think it's ever yeah, been easy and to say that it is like the people i know that are incredibly successful they build their business off of their relationships with people and not necessarily mm -hmm. their art people selling mm -hmm. really high-end prints have an audience of some kind based off of something that they do have said or the a value they provide and they sell art they are not just putting up cool images and selling it that has almost never been a thing um and i just i <laughs> I, I want to stress that I don't believe that that's a negative thing. The problem with wanting to just be an artist, especially when it's early on, is that you have to understand that there is almost no one that's going to just reach out to a random who is making stuff and want to support them. Most people, you know, hold on, hold on. Most people want to support human beings that they can feel connected to. So being an anonymous artist on the internet does zero for a human being to want to get rid of money that they earned to pay you for your work. That is how artists get, you know, set up with really good companies. That's how like, that's how anybody gets anything. It is not because of their art solely almost ever. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine now there are numerous accounts on Instagram and wherever that are set up solely using AI generated art that was made for them once and will never be made again. They take that art, they post it on Instagram and they start trying to monetize. They're going to have a hard time too if they don't already have an audience. I will say I totally agree. you got to build relationships with people and and earn yourself a community of people who know your your passion. Um, I wrote a book in 2020, uh, the Michigan um, Inspired Landscapes uh, edition book that I did. And I've just, you know, put a bunch of work that in 2020, nobody was really able to do much. So I spent a lot of time writing this book talking about um, uh, how I approach photography uh, from a personal level and then threw in just like technical specs and tips for like budding photographers. It's useful. It's It's got some utility and it's pretty. So what I started doing was bringing it to my farmer's markets and just like setting it next to my coffee. And all of a sudden I started selling books when I just really wasn't because people were able to come up talk to me and go, oh, this is your work. And I can, you know, have just in this direct personal relationship with them right away. And they wanted to buy the book because they met the artist, right? Like it's a, it's a relationship thing. It's huge. I want to stress, please don't stop making art. Please don't stop making things <laughs> like yeah. tell stories, build connections. Mm -hmm. Don't just make cool shit as somebody yeah. who just loves bangers. Everybody knows the term bangers is like that photo is a banger, right? Like, I just really like when I get an image that I'm like, that's sick. Almost no one cares. Like, they just don't. Like, you can see banger after banger on the internet all day long. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but if that's a banger in a photo set where me and my friend were able to, like, touch base again, some of my favorite photos that I have that I would consider bangers are, like, I see my buddy Taylor, um, like, once a year. We try to get together and do some kind of trip. And the, the last time I was with him, we went to Utah and he had his motorbike and we went to the salt flats and he's like jumping in the air and he, he looks like an astronaut in space, right? It's one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. But it wasn't just the sick banger. It was a, a series of photos where we were hanging out and I was spending time with one of you know my closest friends. And like that has so much more impact than just like your sick Instagram banger. Like I want to see those. It stories. represents your experience yeah. and your relationship. No, yeah. No. It's, it's so, so rad and it's challenging. It's really hard. Like I'm working on it every day to be better at that. But I can tell you even some of the best on Instagram, the difference between like short stash posting a banger 
and then short stash meeting up with a bunch of his buddies and doing something sick and it's like a really rad photo set i will individually look at all 10 photos in that carousel because it's telling a story and now i'm like Mm -hmm. i'm 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 being brought along to a little adventure that they had, not just like a sick ass photo. I just don't care about sick ass photos. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think you're touching on an important aspect of um, the importance of storytelling beyond how, how aesthetic the object or photo or painting is. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that that's why no one's going to buy your painting one way or the other. It doesn't matter if there's AI art that's better or not. If you don't have, a presence of some kind to latch on to. It's just another pretty picture. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, this this will be ongoing because I'm sure more things will come up. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I feel very strongly that people shouldn't put so much energy into being upset about AI and I need people to continue to create and tell stories and be more genuine because like the TikTok reels that like blow up your stuff, it might make you feel good this year, but working on telling dope stories and having like good art that you've created you'll die and you'll be on your deathbed and you'll look at it and you go hell yeah like i spent all my time doing that not making tiktoks that didn't matter to me and i got like you know ten thousand likes on it or whatever that was sick nobody gives a shit anybody i know who has a really really incredible viral thing it it matters so little um, the, and now we know TikTok can just go in and press a button and make you feel like you earned something really big. Yeah. And yeah, and it's like, man, it's just so depressing because I know people that are so much better than me at so many of the things that I like to do and they're so discouraged by doing it because they feel like it doesn't matter. And it's like, mm-hmm. Jesus, like the number game that we, we've turned life into doesn't matter. Like, uh, like we, you and I talk about it all the time. I'd rather have three people commenting on these videos or my, my posts who are really engaged and love it than like a bunch of just likes. I, I, I operate a Instagram that has well over a hundred thousand followers and yes, part of my metrics of success is like, is this performing today and not? And you know, that page gets shadow banned quite a bit because of the industry. So like, it's a challenge all the time. Mm -hmm. but I can tell you a post that has 25 people interacting and having conversations that I actually asked a question for, but it got 300 likes. I promise you, I argue with my, with my people at the the company all the time. That is so much more important for our brand than the banger that I just dropped that got 65,000 likes or 6,500 likes Mm -hmm. rather. Like I don't care about 6,000 likes when it got like two comments that were like, promote this on this channel and then the other comment was like a fire emoji i don't care (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. i mean if you've got you know a thousand likes that's that's a double tap and a scroll and a move on they'll forget it in an instant but if you've got 20 people actually commenting and then like going to their friends and like saying hey check this out and you know that just multiplies that's a that's actual community and engagement i would take the 20 comments over a thousand likes every day of the week And 20 comments is kind of a lot, especially on Instagram. Yeah. So, like, let's yeah, go, baby. Comments. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, yeah. That was uh, that was that for AI. I, I, I don't find it that compelling. I don't find it that interesting. Uh, bangers are being produced on Instagram all day. I could see them whether they were generated or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, a thing this week that I saw, that I read, that I am excited for because I think its precedence in the gear space is pretty wild that Leica is dropping a Sumacron 35 and 50 mil L mount lens, which for a lot of folks, I think, once that L mount situation with Leica starts to make a little bit more sense, um, as mo- as the Lumix cameras come out and get better and have phase detect autofocus and have not only really nice Lumix glass, but can rock really solid Leica glass natively, mm. there are going to be some photographers that don't care about almost anything other than the fact, because like these sensors are great. All of the sensors on all of these cameras are incredible. It's the the feature yeah. set that they deliver, whether it be their processing power, their AI algorithms uh, for uh, autofocus or whatever, that's cool. But if I just have a really, really good piece of glass in front of that sensor, that's going to trump all of that every single time. <laughs> Yeah, in the year 2023, any camera ever made basically is going to do everything you need, um, minus some of the specialized features or 
ultra speed technologies that, that doesn't matter so much if you've got just amazing glass that you can you can attach to that camera and yes if those panasonic cameras can be opened up to attach some of the finest glass in the world yeah there's going to be people rushing there yeah i mean you know they they've had a, a long-standing relationship like in lumix but uh to have like proper not like lumix branded made by leica but like this is for the the leica camera that also has an l mount those are Sumacrons, baby. That that's gonna be great. <laughs> that's some of the best of the best. I've shot on like a glass. It's nice. Um, it's it's interesting, and I think I think that is kind of the X factor that that system will eventually carry. That will kind of change the scope of uh, Lumix in its uh, where it where it sits with the brands. Because I don't know if you've noticed how many people have been picking up like the uh, because of the X one hundred V and whatever the Leica is the Q whatever the hell um the the fixed lens leica that like everybody got their hands on in the last like eight months um i will never buy a six thousand dollar point and shoot but i would buy really nice glass that goes on a really really nice hybrid camera yeah yeah that's i mean it's a much better argument for sure it's just interesting i like it Mm -hmm. it It is yeah uh did you see the black ZFCs that Nikon released in Japan? I didn't. Um, is it only released in Japan? Uh, so as far as I can tell, uh, currently, yes. But that is super interesting to me because that might mean that they actually care <laughs> about this freaking camera. So they have like multiple colors. I think they're beautiful. Um, yes, they are. I agree. And I just, I look at this and I go, they, they understand that this is a thing that with the right marketing would start absolutely crushing, right? Like, yeah, I, I, I just, it's amazing. I love, I mean, like I said, in, in these modern times, you can't make a camera that ba- doesn't get the basic fundamentals right. Um, every camera is going to be able to work with you in some way, and that includes the ZFC. And the ZFC, in my mind, is one of the most beautiful cameras that's been produced in the modern era. It's gorgeous. I mean, I love basically every colorway that they have. Um, and if I still had the glass, I would probably have one. They're 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 pretty that's for sure i would love to hold one and use one it looks like a capable camera to me yeah um the only the only issue being that they stayed APS-C with that body and right because this is what i was touching on before with the df right it kind of looks like a df right, right? Well, like yeah. a new modern but like retro styled df yeah and it's like the only reason that's that's an issue just so I'm clear, I don't mind that it's APS-C. However, that doesn't differentiate it from a Fuji. The thing that Nikon could do is just have a full-frame camera that does that, and then people go, well, I really liked the Fuji, but I have to have a full-frame because I've been shooting full-frame for 20 years. And Yeah, there are people for sure going to be like that. That's that's a lot of Nikon shooters. That's their It's a lot and it's people. totally fair. It's totally yeah. fair. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Like I'm not right. going to go to APS-C if like I've been shooting for two decades with right. like all of Nikon's full frame, you know, <laughs> the D from like the Absolutely. D2S or whatever. Like if you've been shooting on them boys for a long time, that nobody wants that. Like it's not going to you know do the same thing. I I really really want to see them push that camera because i think that would absolutely change the scope of nikon's marketing and everything what's what's the likelihood that they see this in like the zfc and they go maybe we should apply this to the z8 i mean what if we get a beautiful amazingly capable z8 in that style i mean (laughs) i think that would entice a whole lot of people well what i really need them to do is really crush whatever that marketing situation is i yeah. think the r8 is going to confuse the position of the z8 in their lineup um and it's it's confusing already for a lot of people but like i'm not going to be able to see like the nikon z8 as like a new camera and immediately assume that it's going to be a high-end camera because of that release of the r8 like it's 
it's going to fall short because they already don't do strong enough marketing for any of their cameras when they come out. And right. they, they, they really just have to be like, this is our non, this is our, our D850, right? This is the full frame, not flagship banger of a, of a camera is what it has to be, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And I'd like to see them retro style it maybe or just make it prettier. Um but, and there's nothing wrong with offering those same colorways in a professional setting. I think there's a lot of pros out there who would be real happy with like a yellow professional Z8 type. You know, I think that's totally fair. I, I understand like cost differentials and things like that. It's probably not practical from a manufacturing standpoint, but it would be very cool of them to offer something super pro like a Z8 that's entirely capable of basically any workflow and allow some people to buy some different colorways and in in a retro style there's i don't think there's anything wrong with it i don't i don't think it'd be their flagship dslr like i don't think it'd be the z8 that does that um just because it just doesn't make sense for competition everything it'd be a differentiator but i think it'd be it'd come off more gimmicky i think that golden rod and black camera is f***ing gorgeous though and i want at least two of them like i would i would daily drive that because it's beautiful (laughs) yeah i like them all Yeah, yeah for sure I'm I'm a sucker for it. Um, I, it's it's too hard to speculate for, like what Nikon can do to to really get after it. But they they need to do something. I want them desperately to do something. I want people sure. to to say, you know, I I want literally four major companies duking it out year over year to have the best camera. Um, of course, that's yeah. that's what I want. All of my cameras, regardless of what I choose, will be perfect if they're all at each other's throats and it's just a battle royale all the time and even if they have weird relationships like each of them are buying sony sensors or whatever four at least four three is tough but at least four major companies making cameras pushes each of them to be better and better every year so there's nothing wrong with more in the space the competition is healthy yeah yeah i don't care about the sensors we already we already said that all the sensors are, are great. It's what you, it's what you do with the sensor, right? Like it's it's the software and all the all the stuff you choose to do after that, and then putting glass in front of a good sensor. Um, mm-hmm. I I don't care that Nikon's going to use a Sony sensor. I don't care that Panasonic is likely using uh, similar sensors. I don't care. I mm-hmm. I care about glass and I care about feature sets. Like I need yeah. I need tools on that camera that differentiate it and make it easier and better and uh, you know more compelling for me to to use day in and day out. I can tell you right now, having been actively kind of playing with the A7 IV, uh, it's a chore to use my A7S III now. Um, just having the uh, the camera or the photo to video switch, things like that are so necessary for me. Like I don't, I, I, I basically, I have my A7S III set up right now for 4K 120. Because that's basically what it's offering me unless I need like, you know, really low rolling shutter, which sometimes I do if I'm going to chase around somebody running and shooting and doing all that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Like I'll grab the A7S III, but for the most part, I have no reason not to grab the A7 IV. Um, it's, it's producing the same image. Like it's a great mm-hmm. image. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. Just that little switch, like movie photo switch. If I see the A7C2 come out with that, I will love it yeah. for sure. Oh, absolutely. It's it's a no-brainer. Um, speaking of that little switch thing, as a weird aside, um, Peter McKinnon in his R8 video uh, actually commented on this as a negative thing. Why does Canon just keep changing like where they put stuff on their cameras? Um, I'm glad I'm not like kind of bouncing around their ecosystem right now because like every camera they've moved where the on off switch is they've moved where the movie photo switch is they like they just can't decide if it's going to have a you know the the old school rp thing or like if they're going to have the thumbstick it's like that would be maddening to me yeah it makes sense when the form factor actually changes drastically and things must be moved around but yes when the form factor doesn't change a whole lot why canon why why yeah it's like is there not like a a design language you're trying to assert like i imagine uh, some industrial design engineers like guys can we just listen to me for once and he's been saying it like year over year and they just don't listen to this poor man (laughs) or woman and like i just i i hope they're just like i'm sorry guys i've been trying for years to get them to stop and they won't (laughs) Hmm. it's interesting who knows um 
I I only have uh, two two rumors to talk about this week, but I am actually kind of uh, peaked a little bit because I flirted with Fuji very briefly, and one of the Fuji cameras that I was uh, looking at was their XS series, and okay. it sounds like their next X camera will be their XS uh, successor. Which is their like, it's like the least Fuji looking camera, but it's like their thousand dollar full flippy screen hybrid situation. And I just don't know what they could do to keep a cheap camera nowadays because all of their cameras have been using the same sensor and they basically all have the same features now. So they have like the X-H2, X-H2S, X-T5, do they just limit that it can't record over 15 minutes like some of the lower bodies and say, yeah. here you go? Um, I'm not super well-versed in, in the differentials between a lot of the Fuji bodies, but what I do think I know, correct me if I'm wrong, is a lot of them uh, that change price points um, have a lot of different video options and capabilities. Um, and like you said, they share many sensor qualities and things like that. So yeah, I don't know what they do um, to pare down for a thousand dollar body. The XS20 is, what is that following? Is that an XS10 or something? Uh, hold on, let me pull it up. It was, uh, I think technically it would be an XS30, right? Um, oh yeah, the XS10. So it'll be the XS20. Um, and the, the XS10 is a sick little camera. But so this is the thing. They, when you're looking at their ability to produce cameras, they kind of segmented into so many little bodies yes, that, they, they that they couldn't keep a lot of them in stock. Uh, they had the X-T30 quickly followed by the X-T32, which was weird and random. Like they don't mm -hmm. do that. That's not like, like two is in Roman numeral two. They don't really have yeah. that in their their setup um then quickly after that was the xs10 that i think got discontinued possibly um if it wasn't that it was the uh, another okay it's not discontinued um it was oh, i can't remember the xt200 was the one that got discontinued which is kind of also like the xs10 which had a flippy screen and was kind of video centric so i don't know if they're just like scatter blasting all their ideas and trying to see what sticks or if they just like end up with random parts and they're like, well, what can we do with like, you know, 6,000 units of this particular knob or. <laughs> yeah. You have to wonder if this is the result now of like years past, like five, maybe plus five years ago of them ordering massive amounts of parts. And then later on in the manufacturing era going, all right, what, what can we do with all, all of these things now? Yeah. It's, it's hard as somebody who tries to like understand product releases and stuff, because I do similar work. It's like, I don't, I don't know what's going on over there. I'd love to talk to somebody from over there and like, you know, get some insight because it seems wild yeah. and crazy. Even to drop, it does. yeah, even to differentiate and have three flagship bodies, right? The the XT5, yeah. XH2, and XH2S. Um, it's it's wild. Maybe they just like have people that are like, I think we should do this. I think we should do this, and they're like, well, let's try both, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard Fuji described as like one of those walled garden type companies where you just get what you get and there's no explanation for the direction. You just be happy with it. And, and to be honest, a lot of Fujis just are. They just live in the system and they enjoy it and that's great for them. But it, for people like us who like to speculate on direction and, you know, projection, I have to wonder what is all of these segmented uh, divisions of camera models, what is that doing for them in the next five years? Yeah, and I'm going to say it right now to everybody uh, that is super, super into the X100V, it's not that good. Um, it's it's fun. The XE4 does the same exact thing. The XT series does the same exact thing. Uh, it doesn't provide value for you to spend over $500 above MSRP to get one. If you were like feeling FOMO because you don't, please don't buy one. Um, like especially for $2,000, it is so far from a $2,000 camera. It still feels like a toy. Um, it is It is not ever and will never be a $2,000 camera. Uh, it's crazy to me. It's still going on. People are still into it. I think Chris Brockers just did a video about it on YouTube and I'm like, why? Why? Stop making it a hype 
thing. You're just you're <laughs> making scalpers and you know sell a subpar camera to poor people that are trying to have like context T two clout. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll just reiterate once again, like if you have a Fuji camera, don't feel bad about it. They're all capable. Uh, I love watching Joe Allen's content, um, his travel vlogs, his photography is phenomenal. You can get the job done with basically anything these days. Like I keep saying, that includes you Fuji guys. I mean, you you have capable cameras. They're just sometimes a little overpriced and don't differentiate enough. Oh, I know some people that shoot at XT2 that still shoot better photos than me week over week. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I ain't worried mm-hmm. about it. I ain't sweating. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. It's pretty funny. And then the the last thing for the show today is that we have a photo of the G Master 50 mil 14. Yeah. And I'm happy. I, I'm happy. <laughs> I have an, I have a... I have an A7 IV now, so I have breathing compensation. I don't really care how it breathes. I have a 50 mil that will likely be uh, between fourteen and $1,500 that will do everything that I need a 50 mil to do, and I'll probably be buying it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I see you buying it and being very happy with it, uh, especially if they can keep things like CA down, which <clears throat> I totally expect from Sony, especially if we're seeing this be a $1,400 or $1,500 lens. Um, you know, the fact that it's a G Master, it's going to exist in that space, and that's totally fine. We'd expect that for a G Master. Um, yeah, breathing compensation on the a7 IV, it should be a totally capable lens. Yeah, and I can't, I can't remember. Uh, I'm going to look it up really fast. I don't know if the 1.2 has, like, the new linear motors. Do you know if that's the case or not? I don't know. Yeah, so I, I have to imagine they're going to dump those, like, insane motors into this thing. So it's going to focus as fast <laughs> as it possibly can. That lens is in a price bracket where I'm not doing a ton of research on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's totally fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I don't think it has. Yeah, so I mean, it's gonna it's gonna be a pretty huge update to the the F one two. And like I said, I I rarely need, I so rarely need one two. Like I stop down most of the stuff I do now, and I have twelve thousand eight hundred ISO and S log three that I can deal with with the A seven S three. So like, I'll be fine. I don't know if you've ever seen like native twelve thousand eight hundred ISO on an A seven S three, but it's it's clean at that and um, it's crazy <laughs> yeah uh alan wallace uh an astrophotographer who does youtube channels he used an a7 III for a long time he probably still does um and he vlogs when he's doing astrophotography which means it's at night and he does shoot the iso up and it's fine yeah. it's totally fine that's like one of those things if you have an expectation of it being a bit noisy it performs very well you know what i mean well, so it's yeah, it's totally fine well no you've seen how clean it is at 12,800 though right like it's literally native at that it's, I probably yeah, have. it's it's yeah. mind blowing to me, and it's still like that. And 4K 120 is the only reason I still have an A7S III. But like, damn. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, as a primary video shooter, that one four to one two is not five hundred dollars for me. <laughs> so I'm I'm happy as somebody who's ready to you know spend two grand on a fifty mil. Um, I'm happy to save hundreds of dollars, right? Yeah, I wonder, do you think they just didn't sell as many 1-2s as they anticipated they would, and this is why we're seeing a 1-4 G Master already? I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think they probably you don't sold. Think so? I think, yeah, I think the 1-2 went pretty well. I don't know anybody that owns one that isn't happy with it. Um, oh, yeah. On Reddit, I see it still talked about all the time. Um, I think... Yeah. I think most of the Reddit posts I saw about people buying an A7 V, they bought it with the freaking 51 too. So like, yeah, yeah, like it's um, it's a stellar. I mean, if you're a portrait wedding, whatever, all of those all those folks have one, and it's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's just in a price point that's difficult for a lot of people. So I was curious yeah, if you yeah. thought maybe maybe they didn't sell as many as they thought just by raw numbers. Not that it's a poorly performing lens at all. That's definitely not the case. Yeah, I mean, but, I don't know that many hobbyists that have it, but I yeah. I have very few Sony shooting friends that are like professional professional that don't have it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah. you know, my buddy Ryan, he shoots exclusively the the my old 70 to 200 Mark 1 and a 50 mil 1 2. That's like all he he runs. He doesn't shoot anything else. So now can it be reasonably expected in like maybe next year or year after? 
do we see a 518 g lens that's updated there's a lot of people that are kind of saying it wouldn't be a bad idea to have like three like three price ranges of like prime trinities um like i don't know i don't know if it would be a g or if they even did like an fe 50 mil 18 that was like pretty affordable like closer to like the 35 one eight and the 85 one eight you have um, well that's already that already exists right but it would need to be updated well it would just need to be up because it was literally their first lens that they made so it's it's hot garbage like it has but they don't make fe's anymore do they They're like everything in that range is now g's right but there's nothing else in that range they haven't made anything that cheap really <clears throat> like the right. i wouldn't say i wouldn't say the two fives and the two eight lenses are on the same level as like the FE thirty five one eight and the FE eighty five, you know what I mean? Like they're 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 different enough that that's not the same lens situation. Yeah. Um. And and you know I don't know what they would do. I guess maybe they would do it as a G situation, but um, yeah, it's hard to say because they've only ever done fifties with Zeiss or they're really dog shit. Oh, like original lens. Well, I get they have the fifty macro too, but. I just, in the context of a Sigma 1.4 that performs very well, aside from people who can accept the CA um, on that, it's it's strange that they're going to let Sigma produce this and take a lot of people who would have purchased a $900 G51.4. Um, and people are going to be really happy with the Sigma, um, those who are considering it in the first place anyway. I still would love to see, I keep saying it, I still would love to see Sony put out a 5114G and now it's going to pretty much have to be like a 18G and yep. it'll probably perform very well and it'll be small and that's great, but it's not going to come anytime soon, I feel. Yeah, well, and so here's another consideration. You're 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 considering it from the lens of like, well, you know, that's our space to buy a lens, but what if Sony decided, well, you know, Sigmas can't shoot as fast as ours so we don't need to be at that price level and if we were around that price level people are probably going to pick up the sigma because they have the rapport now too why would we bother selling that lens when we know we can sell it for 1400 bucks because it's a g master and like i don't know there's uh, even reading the the comments on the rumor sites and reading reddit and stuff there's a bunch of people that are going to give up their one two for the one four it seems like for size like for size alone people are for size alone i can see like, it people are really yeah. excited about that lens most sony prime shooters absolutely adore the 35 one four it's so small it's such a utilitarian lens i personally know two wedding photographers that almost exclusively shoot it now <laughs> mm. And like that's, I I think they're crazy. I would never want to shoot like most of a wedding on a thirty-five, but like they do. And I don't want to shoot a thirty-five in general at all. Ever. Well, because you're not you're not a thirty-five <laughs> guy, right? Like yeah, it, yeah it's yeah. totally fair. Um, you're, it's not my you're, range. yeah. You're not alone in that. There's plenty. I think yeah. I think what is it? Chris Nichols absolutely hates thirty-five too. I think. Um, I think it's so boring. Yeah, and I and I disagree because for the longest time I thought fifty was. Um, mm -hmm. I like that slightly wider situation. I don't like ultra wide generally, which is hilarious because I just picked up as ultra as you get. But like, I think wide shots are boring because our phones do it so well. Like, mm -hmm. that's very fair. Like, so once I get to thirty five at one four, and it's it's just wide enough that it seems wide, but it can still blow out a ton of the background. I'm like, that is an interesting lens to me. Whereas, you know, it's really really hard for me to feel the same even about the 21.8 and the 21.8 is an incredible lens and it does something that a lot of things don't like it's a fast mm -hmm. 20 and it's very small but mm -hmm. 20 is super wide i just it was hard for me to like if i had to grab a lens to put on a body it was cool for vlogging for me or a really big wide scene but i didn't like it for shooting like products or shooting like anything around it was not a all-arounder for me whereas like a 35 i can do almost everything on it if i had to yeah and if i had a really quality 35 to play with for like a week or two i'd probably start to like it but it's just one of those things where if i'm walking around doing landscapes or walking around doing street it just doesn't appeal to me yeah. i don't know yeah i mean personal preference yeah, i that's suppose okay. that's how i feel about the 85 right now that's why i was stoked to get rid of mine like i just don't see a need to have that focal length it's just and those pictures i just posted were from the 85 and i love them <laughs> yeah they're great but like i said like i have the 70 to 200 right so often i felt on my 85 
that it was just could do about the same thing. No, that it was just too tight. Oh. That like it was always just a little too tight. I, that you'd rather be at seventy using that. Have the option. Um, yeah. And then I I really like one thirty five. If the if the front element of Sony's G Master one thirty five wasn't such a weak pain point, um, like it has a freaking plastic ring and the the glass is too heavy, but it's a stellar incredible lens to shoot like most things don't look like a 135 18 it looks bananas um yeah i so i 85 is just an awkward position which is i think where you're at with a 35 it's kind of awkward it's not wide enough and it's not tight enough you're like ah, i don't know what to do with that <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah, it, never have i really have never liked it at all yeah, it happens i think uh, to be fair i think when i'm in that range i rather would just have a zoom in general so i'm kind of a zoom you know what's Andy. funny Actually, the day I sold the A7 III, um, I was just like playing around and I stuck it here for this podcast with the 35 on it. I looked at myself, I'm like, oh, damn, that actually works out pretty well. And then I sold it. <laughs> like, I, wonder, I wonder what I'm at. With, without looking, literally put it on. It was at 28 and I zoomed in a little bit. I'm at 35 on my. Yeah. And it's, it looks good. Yeah, because yeah. I like the focal length. Um, it's natural right. to me. Um, I, yeah. I still... I still think there's a version of me that potentially picks up the FE 3518 because it's fast. It has no breathing. It's just a really good <clears throat> cheap lens if I just want a cheap guy to throw on my camera. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been wanting one for a very long time. It, it performs very, very nicely, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, with that, is there anything else going on in your uh, photography life, my guy? No, but I I am itching to get out. The sun is shining. Um, I need, you know, we still got a lot of open water where there's like waterfowl and things. And I just need to get out and spend some time on taking photos of things that isn't coffee for a minute. I need to do some wildlife. I need to get out and do some landscapes. Um, it's like one of those things where I just need a mental break from the business aspect. So very soon, very soon, I keep telling myself that, but very soon I will be out again, just doing nothing but pure art for the fun of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the the last two days has been nice. I went and uh, got lunch with my friends Evan and Hope, and I walked downtown with just a turtleneck on. I had to take my vest off. It was only forty four degrees, but the sun was <laughs> shining and it actually felt warm. And coming back from the mm-hmm. Philippines, where like sixty five in Florida was miserably cold, uh, I'm finally a Michigander again. And uh, <laughs> can... yeah, dude, check this out. It's forty. It's forty two here. Check. Watch. Watch. Watch my face. Bam, dude. It's so sunny out. I need to get outside, dude. Yeah. I'm actually going to sign off of here because Evan smoked some pheasant. And I'm going to go try some smoked pheasant that he made. His dad got a few and uh I'm I'm stoked. I like some I like some bird. So uh yeah. that's what I'm in. I'm probably going to take the 14 to 24 and play around with it today and uh spend the rest of my my uh my Sunday just kind of hanging. So Very cool. All right. Thanks for watching the Light Over Time podcast. And uh, we will definitely hope to let you listen to us soon. (laughs) Thanks for watching, guys. Till next time.